So I'm going to read several verses from the second chapter, contents of the Gita summarized. Uh, I've gotten a few emails that there would be uh, some students coming today, so it's kind of like an introduction, so I'm just going to go over some simple verses to get an idea of this Krishna conscious philosophy and of the Bhagavad Gita. So the first verse I'm going to do is uh, 2 7. Karpanya dosopahata svabhava prichchamitvam dharma samuda chetaha yatstrayasyan nishchitam bruhitanme shishyasteham shadimam tvam prapanam. Now I am confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of miserly weakness. In this condition, I am asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Now I am your disciple, and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. So now this is Arjun speaking to Lord Krishna. He's on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He's fighting with friends and relatives, and he doesn't really think he should be doing this, and he's basically perplexed and it says in the purport that perplexity this is the nature of this material world it's a place where people become perplexed we don't know what to do you might know what to do right now but there are going to be times when you're going to be perplexed you can't make a decision uh, you're not sure what the decision is so here is that's the time you should approach a guru you approach a spiritual master you approach someone in knowledge so Arjuna is approaching the Supreme Personality of God and Krishna himself uh, in, this, in this particular verse, and he's asking for his help. Now, previous to this verse is the whole first chapter and the, and the first six verses of the second chapter. Arjuna and Krishna are friends, but here in this verse, Krishna now becomes his disciple. So there's a different relationship. There's a relationship as a friend. We can joke. I mean, we, you can also joke sometimes with even your guru, and the guru can certainly joke with the disciple. But uh, this sometimes familiarity breeds contempt, so it's, it's careful in these relationships. But as a friend, you can certainly have friendship. You're equals. But as a guru, you're no longer equals. He's superior. So now this is where Arjun finally can't decide, and he takes shelter of Krishna. And then in text 11, Krishna says, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Ashochan Anvashochastvam Pragyavadam Shabashase Gatasun Agatasum Cha Nanu Sochanti Panditaha. The Supreme Personality of God had said, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the dead. So Arjun is perplexed. There are all these relatives. He's going to fight. He's either going to kill them. They're going to kill him. This is not a very nice situation to be in. I mean, we think we have problems. Imagine having people you love, you care, fighting against you in a war. You know, and this is exactly what's happening. He's fighting against his cousin brothers. He's fighting against his grandfather. You know, most people have, you know, a very nice relationship with their grandfather. They don't try to kill him. But here he has to try to kill his grandfather. And his grandfather has to try to kill him. Now you might say, why is this happening? These are kshatriyas. These are warriors. These are their particular service. They have to fight. And a kshatriya has to fight if for the right cause, no matter who he's fighting against, it doesn't matter. Uh, like a good king would even, you know, have to punish his son. If his son does commit some crime, he may punish his son severely to, to teach and set by example. So this is no, we're not going to any of these problems. We have problems. They don't compare to our June's problems. But this is the example. That even, even if it's this dramatic, even if it's this terrible, the situation you're in, still there's a solution. There's a, there is still a right and a wrong. 
Basically, the right is whatever Krishna wants you to do is right. Whatever God wants you to do is right. That's all. It's, it's, it, in that sense, it's very simple, black and white. But we don't always know what God wants us to do. <laughs> That's where the problem. That's why you approach a guru, because a guru is known as also uh, Cheta Guru is a guru in your heart. God is in your heart, and he's instructing you. But you get an, ex an external guru who tells you, because we're not pure enough. So if you accept a bona fide guru, not just anybody who claims to be a guru, but someone who is actually very spiritually advanced, he can tell you what Krishna in your heart is telling you. He's the external representative of super soul or of God in your heart. That's the guru. So here Krishna, of course Krishna is in his heart as Paramatma, and Krishna is also externally there as Bhagavan, so he has no problems. While speaking learned words, so he's speaking really good, high philosophy. If I kill them, what's going to happen? There's no one going to be protecting the woman if all the men are dead. And then the women will be polluted by unscrupulous men and there'll be unwanted progeny. This is what's going to happen if you make me fight this war. He has actually so many good reasons. First time I read Bhagavad Gita, I was completely on Arjun's side. <laughs> I thought Arjun was making more sense than Krishna. Krishna is telling him to fight and kill. Why? He wants to do the right thing. He's willing to renounce it. I had no idea of Vedic culture. I had no idea of Kshatriyas. I had no idea of the concept of duty. You have a duty you have to perform. Doesn't matter if you, you may have to hurt somebody, you have to do it. As a kshatriya, they have to hurt someone sometimes, and they have to do their duty. Of course, this particular war is a little different because Krishna, God, is right there telling him what to do. If God, we don't have that, we don't have it that easy. You know, He's also telling us in his in our heart, but unless we're pure, I remember someone asking Srila uh, Prabhupada. When you leave, this was before he was even ill, you know, when you leave, will we get directions as to what to do from super soul in the heart? He said, yes, but unless you're pure, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to understand those directions. So until we're pure, we can't really understand exactly what Krishna is telling us. We may get some glimpses according to how much we surrender. He says, as you surrender unto me, I reward you accordingly. So as we surrender, we get some realizations of what Krishna wants. But we're not constantly in touch with super soul in our heart at every moment. And we can be if we're pure. But that purity comes from surrender. As you surrender, you're rewarded accordingly. Exactly to the proportion in which you're surrendered, that much you're rewarded. And you're rewarded with spiritual knowledge with realizations not rewarded with you know a nice new mercedes ben <laughs> or a flat screen tv <laughs> this isn't the rewards he's telling you about how you reward it accordingly of course even if you re if you surrender to those things he'll reward you with those things too everything is ultimately coming from krishna even in material things but the real reward is not a material reward. Just like Veda means knowledge. Veda means knowledge. It deals with all kinds of knowledge. But what's the essence of the Vedas is the spiritual science. That's the essence of the Vedas. To know Krishna. Vedais cha savaya ham eva vedyo vedanta krid veda vid eva cha ham. By all the Vedas, I am to be known. The whole purpose of the Vedas is to come and know Krishna. Come and know God. That's the purpose of the Vedas. It has so many other purposes, but that's not the real purpose. The real purpose is knowing who you are, who God is, and your relationship with God. That's the purpose of the Vedas. And that's what the essence of the, the Bhagavad Gita is, like the essence of the Mahabharata. And the Srimad Bhagavatam is the essence of all the Vedic literatures. And it just deals with understanding our relationship with Krishna, who Krishna is and our relationship. There, there's ten cantos. It, the tenth canto, sometimes there's twelve cantos, but sometimes people go directly to the tenth canto and read about Krishna's pastimes with the gopis. And they skip the first nine cantos. The first nine cantos makes, you, makes it perfectly clear who Krishna is. So unless you know 
Krishna is the supreme personality of God, and without any doubt, then when he does these activities, you can appreciate them on a transcendental level. Otherwise, if you go to, uh, directly to the 10th canto of these uh, Shabda, what is it called, Shabda Brahma? Well, they have seven days of, they, they read Bhagavatam, and they start with the 10th canto. This is Bhagavad Shabda, thank you, thank you. Bhagavad Shabda, this, so this is, uh, this is not, this is wrong. You have to start from first canto. You start at the lotus feet, the 10th canto is this beautiful, smiling face. You start his lotus feet, his ankles, his calves, his thighs, his waist, his chest. Then you go up to his beautiful smiling face. You don't just jump to that. Even when you look at the deities, you're actually supposed to start looking at his their feet and then you work your way up. Is that right? <laughs> so, here, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Now, this is interesting because they're friends. But now he said, those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Now he's taken the position of a guru. He's mild, mildly chastising Arjun. Basically saying you're a fool in a nice way. You're lamenting for what's, why you shouldn't lament. Why are you lamenting? Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the dead. It's, you're, not, you're not very wise, Arjun, or you wouldn't be worried about this. So he's, he takes the position of the guru. And then he says, Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So now he's stressing. Number one, he's stressing individuality. Never was there a time when I, nor you, nor all these kings ever existed, nor in the past, at the present, or in the future. He's stressing individuality from the past, the present, and the future. Okay, so you're always an individual. So why are you lamenting? Because you're changing bodies. If anything, you should be happy for your grandfather changing bodies. Now he'll get a better body. That body was so old, troublesome. Because if you die on a battlefield as a kshatriya, you'll reach the heavenly kingdom. And the next verse is a really good verse. Dehi no sminyata dehe komaram yovanam jara. As the embodied soul continuously passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. So this is a very important verse quoted uh, quite often from Bhagavad Gita. How you're not the body. You had a little baby's body, you had a little boy's body, you had a youth's body, a man's body, you have an old man's body, and then an old wrinkled man's body, and then you leave that body. Just like you changed bodies, you, you had a different body. When you, the body as a baby or as a child doesn't exist anymore. That body is completely gone. I, think, I believe scientists say that every cell in your body is changed within seven years. So the body you have now is entirely different from the body you had seven years ago. But you can remember what you did seven years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You can remember, so there's something that's constant, but it isn't the body. What is it? This is what Krishna is telling Arjun, it's the soul. You are the soul. You're not the body. Some people, they say, you know, I, I have a soul. It's not that you have a soul, you have a body. You are the soul. You're eternal, the body is temporary. The body is destined to die. Destined to die. Birth, disease, old age, and death. This is what happens with the body. But you're, you're not affected by this. You shouldn't be affected by it. You're affected by it because you're identifying with the body. Don't identify with the body, identify with who you are. 
Devotee asked Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, I'm so selfish. Srila Prabhupada said, it's okay to be selfish if you know who your real self is. So if you're identifying with who you are, I'm a spirit soul, and I'm concerned what's best for me, that's fine. It's just if you're selfish, thinking you're the body, that's a, that's a problem. You're not that body. Don't do what's best for your body. Do what's best for you. Because it's good to keep a good, healthy body so you can use your body in Krishna's service. You should maintain it, just like a car. I mean, a car, it's an instrument. You take care, you change the oil so that you can keep using it for whatever service you, you're doing. So the body is an instrument. It's meant to be worked and used by the soul. So you maintain it nicely, you take care of it. Change the oil every once in a while. <laughs> in the body. So as the embodied soul continuously passes in this body from boy to you to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. What's the big problem? It just passes into another body. I mean, it doesn't pass into another body walking by. <laughs> The soul is, is a spirit soul. So what happens at the time of death, depending on your consciousness, you get another body. You can get another human body, you can get an animal body, but you're put into the womb of a, of a, of a rhinoceros. <laughs> put into the semen of a rhinoceros and a womb, womb of a rhinoceros, and then you come out as a rhinoceros depending upon what you did in this life. I don't know what you have to do to become a rhinoceros. <laughs> but you can take any type of a body. But if you develop a little bit God consciousness, even just 1% God conscious in this life, you're guaranteed at least a human birth so you can continue the process. The rhinoceros doesn't do anything for his spiritual progress. He just eats, sleeps, mates, and defends. That's all a rhinoceros or any animal does. That's animal life, eating, sleeping, mating, defending. So we also eat, sleep, mate, and defend, but that's not all we do. We can also understand who we are, who God is in our relationship with God. The animals cannot do that. I mean, a dog might think you're God, you know, become your servant nicely, but doesn't underst can't understand any, any <laughs> philosophical idea of, of, of God existing. So the animals eat, sleep, mate, and defend. We also eat, sleep, mate, and defend. But we also can understand who we are, who God is, our relationship. And if we make some progress in that spiritual uh, goal, then we can take birth minimum as at least a human being in our next life. So we continue the process. Man proposes, God disposes. You want something, you show God by your actions that you want it. And if you want to make some spiritual progress, you show them by your actions. You have to do something. You know, what is it about to walk the walk, talk the talk? Or something? <laughs> you, yes, thank you. <laughs> you got you to gotta do something. Even if you want something material, you know, you want to make a lot of money. You, you have to, you know, I want to make a lot of money. I want to be rich, but I don't do anything about it, so I don't really want it. If I really wanted to be rich, I'd figure out, I'd start some business, I'd work really hard, I'd do certain things to try to get rich. And if, of course, ultimately it deals with my karma, but if my karma is there, then I could become rich. But I'm not going to become rich just by doing nothing. Because man proposes, God disposes. If I really want to, to, I want something, no matter what it is, material or spiritual, I have to show by my actions that I want. My desire and my actions have to be in accord. I can't say I want this and I don't do anything about it. So I want spiritual life, but I don't do much. How much of my life is involved in the spiritual aspect? I have you know, almost all the time devoted to my material well-being, and I put a little time aside, maybe, if, I'm, if there's time for some spiritual activity. So we should have a balance. It should be both, not just spiritual, but the material, you, do, you take care of things too. Srila Prabhupada says, wherever there's spiritual well-being, automatically material well-being will follow. 
You have to have faith in Krishna. Krishna gives the ant a few crumbs a day, gives the elephant a few hundred pounds of food a day. And if you surrender to him, if you give your life to him, he's going to take care of you. You're not going to be, it's not going to be any lacking. You're going to get everything you need. And that takes some faith. And at first you have to have some faith. Even if you don't have a lot of faith, if you have some faith, Krishna will show you. He'll give you some realization. He'll give you some taste. He'll give you something to increase your faith. But you have to have some faith to begin. So this here, this is just a practical matter. Everyone has to agree that they change bodies in this lifetime. Can you take the cartels away from it, baby? Everyone has to agree that, you know, I did have a baby's body. I mean, I could see pictures. I don't remember too much. I had a boy's body and a man's body. And, you know, that we're getting older. The body's changing. But I can remember different things. And that body doesn't exist. So I am certainly different. So it's just kind of a scientific way of looking at it. How I'm not this body. It's the very beginning of spiritual life. Is to know who you are. At least know who you're not. Even if you don't know you're a spirit soul, you have to conclude, I'm not this body. That's the problem. Everyone, you ask anyone, who are you? 99.9% .9 will answer in relationship with their body. I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm a carpenter, I'm a janitor, I'm a president, I'm a professor, I'm a student. It's all relation to the body. You're not any of those things. That's your body. Who are you? Since the beginning of spiritual life is trying to understand who I am, self-realization. If you understand who you are, then you automatically will understand who God is. Because you're a part and parcel of him. You're eternal. You're full of knowledge. You're full of bliss. You're like a drop from the ocean. Same quality, not the same quantity. So if you, if you understand who you are, then the next step is you'll understand who God is. Sometimes people get mixed up. They actually understand that I'm eternal. I'm eternal, so therefore I must be God. Because you're eternal doesn't mean you're God. It means you have a similar quality as God. God is eternal, and you're a part and parcel of him, so you're also eternal. But you're infinitesimal. God is infinite. So there's a big difference between the, the two. You're eternal, you're full of bliss, full of knowledge. Just like the drop from the ocean is a big difference between the drop, even though it has the same qualities as the ocean, and the ocean. Big difference between a spark and a huge fire. You don't mind, you know, you can squeeze a spark between your fingers and that's the end of that. <laughs> but the fire is really bad. <laughs> you try to die that out. <laughs> so we are not these bodies. But if we understand who we are, we have a better chance of understanding who God is. And then when we understand who God is, then what is my relationship? What's the relationship between the part and the whole? The part serves the whole. The part of the machine serves the whole. The part of the body serves the body. The hand takes the food, puts it in the mouth. The hand is nourished. It serves the body. The hand tries to enjoy banana, rice and dal, whatever. It's not going to get any real satisfaction. It may feel good. Oh, it feels nice squashing this up. <laughs> but if you don't do anything with, else with that food besides squashing it up, your hand and the whole rest of the body is going to die. So the part is meant to serve the whole. We're meant to serve God. That's our eternal occupation. We're eternally servants of God. And it doesn't matter what faith you believe in. You could be a Christian. And then you can change to a Jew. You can change to a Muslim. You can change to a Hindu. You can change your faith. But it doesn't matter what faith you are. You're an eternal servant of God. We're not saying you're anything else. This is called Sanatan Dharma. We, don't, we're not, we, actually not, we would not claim ourselves to be Hindus. Hindu religion is a little bit... It's, it's kind of like today, nowadays, it's like a phantasmagoria. There's so much involved in Hinduism. But we, are, we would consider ourselves aspiring to be Vaishnavas. Or for someone who knows nothing about Vaishnavas and knows something about Hinduism, you might say we're orthodox Hindus. 
But that's just for understanding, because even the word Hindu is not in the Vedic literatures. It's not anywhere in the Vedas. But the faith that someone has can change. You can change that. But the eternal occupation of the soul as a servant of God doesn't change. It doesn't matter what particular faith you believe in, you're still an eternal servant of God. And whatever helps you, whatever faith gets you to the point of realizing you're an eternal servant of God, then that's good. That's positive. We're not saying everyone has to do exactly this. Whatever particular faith you're following, and if, if, it, if you come to love God, then it's, then it's a success. But if you don't come to that point, then it's, it may have helped you a little bit, but it didn't really come to the goal. The goal is to develop your love for God. That's the goal of this life. So if we follow these teachings of Bhagavad Gita, and no matter what faith you believe in, you can add this chanting to your life, which will help purify and get you to realize who you are and who God is. It's a, it's a very positive alternative. You don't have to take anything away, just add this to your life. So, actually, I'm going to read some more verses, but before I do, because I don't want to read so much and then and there's no time for questions or people may forget. Anyone have any questions now? Any questions about anything I said or read? Okay. I don't know what that. Everybody agrees or don't understand? <laughs> yes? You said like the hand is part of the body and a spark is part of the fire. Does the soul have parts as well or is it one single thing? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm going to give you my answer, which I hope is right. <laughs> but the soul is one. The soul, it says, the soul cannot be cut into pieces by any weapon, nor moistened by fire, nor withered by the wind. This is in the Bhagavad Gita. The soul is one. It's, it's, it's not, there's no parts of the soul. Although the soul, when you understand who you are, you're a person. You're not, you're not like just an energy or a force, but you're actually a person. You have a head. You have a hand. You have a body. Well, it depends. You could be a plant, too, in the spiritual world. I mean, uh, you could be a blade of grass, but you're still a person. Just, hey, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> I don't know what you do as a blade of grass. <laughs> but but you're, you're anxious for Krishna to come and step on you. But you're a person, and you have personality, and God is a person, and you have a relationship with him. And you could be his friend. You could be his lover. You can be his, he can be your child. You can be his father. You could be his mother. You know, so you have an eternal relationship. So you are one, and, but, and you have a form. But that form is not like this form. This, it looks maybe like they said God is in the image of man, or man is in the image of God, or whatever that is. But basically, he has form, and we have form. And we look like a person, but we, our body is, it says, sat chit ananda vigraha. Vigraha is form eternal, full of knowledge, and full of bliss. So we don't even know what the substances are. Eternality is a substance, and you have a body made of that, bliss and knowledge. That's what your body is made of, and it's one. So it is one, and Krishna is one, and you have a, an, a body made of the same body that Krishna has. Krishna is also eternal, full of knowledge, and full of bliss. There's two types of schools. There's the personalist, which we are, that God is a person in the highest sense. Vedanti tat tatva vidas tatvam yajgyanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti shabhyate. That the absolute truth is understood in three phases, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Brahman is the absolute truth. It's the all-pervasive aspect of God, Brahman. It's all-pervasive one sound, light, it's all one energy. That's one aspect of God, but that's not the complete aspect. Paramatma is also situated in your heart. And then Bhagavan is he's actually a person, like standing in front of you when you have a relationship with him. And that's the most 
complete aspect of the absolute truth. So we're talking about the highest aspect of the absolute truth, and that sense the soul has form and personality, as it has a relationship with God, and has a relationship with other souls also. So the soul is one. <laughs> yes. Does the soul have some size? Size? Well, at least it says in this body, the soul is one ten thousandth the tip of a hair in size. It says like the tip of a hair, you can't even really measure that, but one ten thousandth the tip of a hair. If you take a tip of a hair and you cut it into ten thousand parts, that's the size of the soul. But yet from that little tiny thing, all the energy, even the scientists say all the energy comes from the heart. The soul is located in the heart. God is also located in the heart. It says it's like two birds in a tree. Whereas one bird is eating the fruits and the other bird is just sitting waiting for this bird to notice them. So we're just externally in this world just eating the fruits, taking whatever we can. And God is just waiting for us to turn around. Hey, what are you doing? Why don't you have some of these fruits? <laughs> So, any other questions before I read the next verse? Matras pashas tu kaunteya shitoshna sukadukada agama paino nityas tamstitik shashvabharata. O son of Kunti, the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress and the disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception of skyna bharat, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. This is a really nice verse. Uh, the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress. So there's also permanent happiness. There's actually no permanent distress. But permanent happiness is spiritual happiness. So they're not talking about spiritual happiness. The non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course, this is material happiness, material distress, are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. So we have the winter, this is the distress part. <laughs> and then there's the summer. So we have... Uh, winter and summer seasons are always changing. Happiness and distress is always coming and going. This is really important because sometimes people foolishly think that they're in distress. I mean, they're, out, they're in distress and they're thinking they're always in distress and there's no hope. And people wind up committing suicide because they think there's no hope. But there, there's guaranteed you can't stay in distress even if you wanted to. I mean, why would you want to stay in distress? I mean... I could think of only one reason, but that, that, that was for, with myself. Well, I, I was in the Navy. I was distressed with this whole stupid Navy thing. And then they, they sent me to some psychiatrist, and I thought, wow, I'm going to get out of the Navy. <laughs> and then I got happy, even though I knew that would ruin my chances. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. I wound up staying in. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I can't think of any reason why anybody would want to stay distressed. But even if you wanted to, you can't. You have to become happy. Happiness comes automatically, and distress comes automatically. And you, 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 know, you can't keep the happiness, and you can't even keep the distress. It's going to come and go. So what does Krishna say? He says, they arise from sense perception, Skyna Bharat, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. So in other words, I have my service to do. I have my duty to perform. I have to serve Krishna. So therefore, I'm happy. I serve Krishna. I'm distressed. I serve Krishna. I don't let it interfere with my service. Like, for instance, we have people here who come to the temple and make garlands, like once a week, or do some other service. So they do that service, whether they're happy or they're distressed, that's part of the duty. Just like you work. I mean, most people, they go to work, they say, oh, I can't work today, I don't feel, I feel distressed. 
I can't work. Well, you ain't going to have a job. You're going to increase your distress when you don't have any money and you're out on the street. You've got to do things whether or not you feel like doing it. But it's interesting here. Now, also, tolerate them. You have to tolerate happiness. You don't generally think how happiness interferes with what you're doing. But sometimes you become so elated, you're not doing very nice service because you're so happy. So even happiness, you have to tolerate. I, more important, I do my service. You know, Krishna was being fanned by his devotee who's fanning Krishna, and he's feeling, you can't imagine how great you'd feel fanning the Supreme, fanning God. You'd feel so ecstatic. And he started feeling like this, but it interfered with his fanning. So he controlled that ecstasy. He didn't want to feel that. I, he just wanted to fan nicely because it interfered with his service. So happiness can certainly interfere with your service, and distress, everyone knows, can interfere with your service. So Krishna says, tolerate them without being disturbed. So you just continue doing what you know you're supposed to do. Okay, we have another 15 minutes. Any other questions yet? Yes. Wow, that's nice. One's greatness is measured by one's ability to tolerate provoking situations. Yeah, I'm not that great. <laughs> yes. No, 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 I didn't say, I, okay, your distress will not last. You have to get so much distress and so much, not that the distress leads to happiness. You're going to get happiness. It's not that the distress is causing the happiness. It's just going to come of its own accord. And I said, no one, I said, I can't, can't think of any reason why anyone would want to be distressed except for the example I gave, because that would have got me out of the Navy, but, okay. Okay, well, we, when you're getting onto the transcendental platform, you're not interested in either of them because they're external material things. They have a beginning and an end. We don't want our happiness to ever end. We want, to, we want our happiness to last eternally, and that's only on the spiritual platform. So this, this happiness and says specifically says the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress. So that is material happiness and distress, and we're not interested in either of them. It's, it's almost like even karma. Karma. You do good karma. You do something good, then you have to come back in your next life so somebody does something good to you. You give a million dollars in charity. In your next life, you come back, so, so somehow you get a million dollars. Now, we say good karma or bad karma, it's all bad. We don't, want any, we don't want to have to get any reaction in the next life. We don't want a next life. So we want to, when you work for God, or for Krishna, then there's no material reaction to that work. And that nullifies whatever material re reaction you were supposed to get for other karma. So we say good karma or bad karma, it's all bad. You know, we, there's, there's karma. Karma actually means good karma, technically. Then there's uh, V-karma, which is bad karma, right? V-karma. And then a karma is action that has no material reaction. And that action is when it's performed for God. There's no material reaction. So that's what we're, we are interested in. We're not interested in any temporary happiness. Uh, I mean, this is the ideal. I'm not saying I'm, I'm above all temporary happiness, you know. Get, get a nice piece of sweet ball, that, but it's offered. I wouldn't take it unless it's offered. But I'm not only eating it just because it's offered. <laughs> I'm eating it because it tastes really good. So, you know, we, we may not be on that platform, but that is the platform we should be striving for, is to come to the platform where 
I am, I'm not interested in any material happiness or material distress. It doesn't matter. I don't, I'm going to get, we shouldn't strive for it. You're, in this life, you're born, you're going to get so much happiness and so much distress no matter what you do. You may not get exactly the, the, the happiness you, you wanted. Like, for instance, you may not have a lot of money, but you'll be happy. You're still going to be happy whether you have a lot of money or you don't have a lot of money. In your own mind, you're thinking, I have to have a lot of money to be happy. But you're going to be just as happy with it or without it. You're, you're allotted. At the time of birth, you're already, your happiness and distress is already there. So you don't have to waste your time trying to get happiness. It's going to come of its own accord. Better you devote your life to God. And then you can get rid of all of this temporary happiness and distress. Anyway, this is our philosophy of <laughs> Krishna consciousness. And all we, I mean, if you really want to be a little scientific, you try it. You apply it to your life, you know. You just give it a week. Try chanting Hare Krishna for a week, see what happens. And if you actually chant and surrender to that chanting, you'll, without a doubt, get a very positive result. I talked to a man who was an atheist. He's a friend of mine. Uh, he's, he has a flower place, and we buy flowers. And I talk to him all the time. I give him prashadam. Prashadam is food offered to Krishna. So I just give it to him, cause I, and I let him know this is to purify him because he needs help. Uh, <laughs> And he, and he eats it, and it's like, ah, oh, he's like, now he's spiritual. Anyway, but he told me about, I was telling him about how if you really want something, you know, if you act in such a way, things happen. And he said, even though he doesn't believe in God, he actually sees that happening. He says, when you try to obtain something, somehow or other, things, you know, doors open and things work out. The, the way they, they, they were not working out before, when you actually make the effort. He still doesn't believe in God, but he sees that and he can't explain it. I mean, it's, he's an intelligent man in, 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 in that sense, that, but he's not as intelligent enough to accept that it's God. <laughs> but he eats a lot of prashad <laughs> Any other questions? Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha, ubayorapi dristontas, tvanayos tattva darshibi. Those who are seers of the truth, seers of the truth, they've concluded, they see the truth, they know the, conclu the truth, concluded that of the non-existent, the non-existent, it says the material body. It's non-existent because it's there and it's gone. In that sense, it's non-existent. It's not that it doesn't exist, not that this body is not there. It's there, but in, you know, 100 years, 200 years, there's nothing left of it. So there is no endurance. So of the non-existence, the material body, there's no endurance. And of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. So we can see the body is... What's all that noise? Is that you? <laughs> anyway, the body is temporary, the soul is eternal. I'm going to have to get up here. <laughs> That which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. The material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight, O descendant of Bart. Of course, now we're back to the fighting, given his practical instruction. The body is temporary anyway. 
going to die. What's the difference if you die now or you die five years from now? The only difference is, oh, I may be able to do these certain things before I die. I mean, if you're going to, you know, any, any devotee, if they knew they could die right now and go back to Godhead, I mean, they would die. <laughs> it's like if I have that choice, if I could die right now and guaranteed to go back to Godhead, okay, I'll take it. Let somebody else worry about everything else in this world. I'm going. You know, we're not positive we're going back to Godhead, but if we actually had that option, I'll, you know, we'd, we'd take it. So, but, you know, if you're going to die, the only difference is I may have more time to be Krishna conscious if, if, I, had, if I had a choice. Like Ajamil, Ajamil was dying. He's on his deathbed. Now, he was a devotee when his youth. Then he became a very degraded person. He was a thief, and he did so many bad things. And he, and he had one son. His, uh, old, his, his youngest son he named Narayan, which is a name for Krishna, a uh, name for God. So Ajamil, when he was dying... He called out to his son, Narayan. But because Narayan is a name of God, first of all, what happened when he was dying is the Yamadudas. Yamadudas are very fierce, ugly, hairy, thick, hairy, kind of like beast, human beast combination, really heavy, strong. They come at the time of death for those who are not devotees. <laughs> and they... They put a noose around your subtle body and they rip you out of this body and you, you're bitten by dogs and vultures and it's like a really, really bad scene. Like a bad dream, but it ain't a dream. It's real. <laughs> and then you got to go to the court of Yamaraj and you got to be judged for everything you've done. You know, I thought I was pretty good. You know, well, <laughs> think again, buddy. <laughs> So at this time, when he was being ripped out of the body, but he said, Narayan, then, then, uh, then the constables of, of Vishnu, the Vishnu Dudas, they came, and they're very beautiful. And they stopped the Yama Dudas from ripping this person out of their body. And they said, no, he called Narayan. He's protected. And they said, who are you? <laughs> so, we're, we're, the, we're the Vishnu Dudas, you know? And he said, but we never saw you before. We can't stop. Nobody can stop us, but we can stop you. <laughs> so they stopped him. Then they went back to Yamaraj, and he asked Yamaraj, well, what happened? You know, we always rip people out of their bodies, and all of a sudden we got stopped. And then Yamaraj explained to him that those are the Vishnu Dudas. They're, they're, they're the servants of Lord Vishnu, and, you know, whatever they say goes. So if they want to stop him... So then, what happened with uh, Ajamil is he got an opportunity to stay in that body longer. He didn't die at that time. It was his time to die, but he didn't die because the Vishnu Dudas came and they let him stay in that body long. So what he did at that point, he left home, he gave up all his bad habits, he went... <laughs> He went to, to a very sacred place and he meditated and he chanted. And then when his mind was full of Krishna, Krishna, then he left his body and went back to the spiritual world. But that's... Uh, I don't remember why I told that story. <laughs> Anyway, it's a nice story. It must have had something to do with something. <laughs> it had to do with distress. Distress? No. It's a joke. Oh, joking. Okay. It was after the distress. What? Karma. Oh, karma, v karma. No, and, oh, anyway, I don't know if that was it. When we look at this video, we'll find out what it was. <laughs> It's really not easy when people are screaming, banging, and you try to say something. I could do it for a while, but then I kind of lose it. I lose my train of thought. 
Okay, we got about a minute. Any questions? All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yes. Yes. Yes.